Hello, I'm Ronnie Eldridge. Welcome to Eldridge and Company. Common Cause is a nonpartisan, nonprofit organization dedicated to making government more honest, open, and accountable to people, not to special interests. Susan Lerner is the executive director of Common Cause New York, and she works tirelessly to make these good things happen. She's my guest today. I'm sort of laughing because there are so many good things that have to happen to make this come true. Right? Well, it's the tireless part of it. Tireless, <laughs> that's, that's true. Yeah. That is unfortunately the most accurate. Um, there are many, many issues with our governance right now. You've spent a lot of time in the state, and yes. the state operates. Do you think the state government would operate better if it was operating from New York City? I don't know that it's placement. Um, I think it's the, the way the system is set up to divide the city from the rest of the state. It might be somewhat better if elected representatives actually were familiar with New York instead of having this demonized oh. picture uh, <laughs> in their heads. Uh, but the basic problem is that right now we're electing too many people who are responsive to special interests and not responsive to run ordinary New Yorkers. So it's all so intertwined, isn't it? You get elected officials, and how do they get elected? And they get elected, we gotta talk about how they get elected, elections. But also, what always has amazed me is they get elected with so few votes from many districts. Well, uh, they, <laughs> that's really, I think, at the core of what we're talking about, and that is the problem with our election system that turns people off that makes them feel that they don't have a voice in the process. And quite frankly, it's baked in to our election administration. We are a state where elections are run by Democrats and Republicans, by political parties, and it shows. Our election administration is firmly mired in the 19th century, and efforts to bring it into the 21st century are vigorously, vigorously uh, objected to by the political parties who are petrified that if we actually modernize our elections, if we bring them up to a contemporary standard, that the stranglehold which they have on election administration might be loosened and people might actually vote for somebody other than party bosses have designated. So our system allows them to really sink their talons into election administration and not let go. And there are definitely times when it feels like the political parties have a stranglehold on election administration. They don't want to see expansion. They don't want to see change. And they do everything they can uh, to ensure that the system isn't modern and efficient. That has the impact of discouraging voters. It's so, it's so interesting because it comes at a time of great disenchantment. So I would assume, I don't know what the figures are, but people who register to vote are not necessarily going to register with a political party. I mean, they see themselves as being non, not nonpartisan, but not affiliating with any party. Well, Ronnie, you brought up a really interesting point, because one of the things that we do at Common Cause is we do regular registration work. Last year, we put teams of volunteers and student interns out on the street at street fairs and events throughout the city with a concentration on North Brooklyn because we wanted to see if we could do outreach to the 20, 30 somethings who are now living in large numbers in those areas and seem to be disengaged from their neighborhoods. And I cannot tell you the number of times that we would say to somebody, would you like to register? And the young person would say to us, no. I'm not interested in the political system. There's, it's corrupt. I don't like any of those people. I wouldn't vote, which is just a mistake because when you don't vote, you're voting for the status quo. You have cast yeah. a vote uh, without realizing that you have. But if we do talk them into registering, and we're persuasive and we mm -hmm. get people to fill out the forms, when they come to the point where they need to check a box that picks a political party, we're nonpartisan. We have absolutely no investment in having someone pick one party versus another party. But we do tell people here in New York City, if you don't pick a political party, chances are you're, you are not going to be able to vote in the primary, and that may be very important in the district you live in. The response often is, well, I'm willing to register, but I don't want to be associated with any of the political parties. And that's exactly how these guys stay in office. Yes. And how the parties control it. Because especially in New York, and I don't know the upstate so well, but in New York City, if you look at the primary results, the incumbents will win in a primary with 
3,000 votes. I mean, it, it's impossible almost to unseat an incumbent through the electoral process. It's difficult. It can be done. Um, and it happens and it, every once in a and while. And it happens every once in a while. Now, the flip side of that is if it's a 3,000 vote margin, if you do have a well-organized, well-backed challenger, if that person can get on the ballot, because remember, it's the incumbents who write the election law right. rules, which make it hard to get on the ballot exactly. if you're not backed by the political party. It's another way in which the political party weaves themselves into the system to ensure that they have a grip on it and that their choices will have the primacy. So if somebody does get on the ballot, they have fewer people who are going to come out for a but primary. So you have a chance, if you're a strong candidate with really decent backing, to actually to challenge. But then but you need money. You need money. <laughs> you need the backing of well-recognized organizations and people in the community. Because if you're coming as an unknown, then it's who endorses you yeah. that is a signifier for the voter. And that may be a hard endorsement to get because incumbency has its advantages. Incumbency can give favors. Incumbency has member items. Incumbency is involved in the political party. And if there's something that they need, you know, there are many, many times in Albany, and frankly, somewhat in the city council as well, where an elected official will say to the speaker, I need this bill for my district. Absolutely. I need this for my reelection. I need this to happen with parking. Or I need this sort of organization to get a break because I'll have trouble with my reelection. We have an extraordinarily high reelection rate in this state. Not quite as high in the city, but still pretty and high. And why, why do we need these guys reelected? Because they've, in turn, always supported the leader of the body, right? Right. And right. so here you've got another person who dispenses uh, gifts to maintain their position. It, it's just never ending. Well, it's, it is definitely a circular situation yeah. where everybody benefits but the voters. But I think the important thing to remember is when you do have a low turnout election situation, as unfortunately we do currently mm -hmm. in our state, a civically minded individual with strength of character and some backing can actually get in there and make a difference. I'm not ready to give up on our system. That's why I do the work that I do. The basic concepts are so compelling that it really gives us something to aspire to. Even if we get a little bit closer to what our ideal is, we've made a significant difference because the basic concepts I think are so important and the essence of democracy um, is just a very attractive idea. It is and there isn't so, so far any substitute for it. But let's go back. Now you go then the, the bodies that control the whole election process. There's the state board of elections, and then each county has its own board of elections, except for New York City, which has a city board of elections. Correct. Right? Correct. And so is it true that in all of those counties, as well as the state, it's appointees by the Democratic Party and by the Republican Party that comprise the boards? That's correct. It is the county leaders of the two <laughs> most popular parties who get to handpick their representatives on the boards of elections. And even more amazingly, the board, boards of elections are all comprised of even numbers. Oh, so if the Democrats decide that they would like to see something change, they can be absolutely blocked by the Republicans. If the Republicans decide they would like to institute a change, they can be stopped by the Democrats. That's why it's so hard to get reform in this state and through the boards of elections where you think they would have an investment in accessible, well-run elections. And they have very little investment in that. What they ha are invested in is their, is, job. is their jobs and ensuring that the people who appointed them right, get are, re are <laughs> happy with them. Now, sometimes they're elected, but sometimes the party leaders, they're elected within the party, yeah. but they don't hold other office. But here in New York City, we have at least three party leaders um, who hold, or two, the dual, the two dual. party, who are legislators at the same time. You're making me take this deep breath. <laughs> <laughs> so, it back all the frustration. In Manhattan, the chair of the Democratic Party of Manhattan is Assemblymember Keith Wright. And in Queens, the chair of the Queens Democratic Party is Congressman Joe Crowley. 
And yet when we go to the polling place and the lines are ridiculously long and things aren't set up well and the poll workers seem to be confused, we call the mayor. The mayor actually has very little power, has no control over the board of elections. So who it's does? The party leaders. And who does though? The legislature? The Basically, legislature sets the rules, but then again, who controlled. tells the legislature what to do? So, for instance, Speaker Sheldon Silver introduced a bill to set up a system called early voting, which means that voters would be able to cast their ballots in advance of Election Day. Thirty-two states around the country use early voting. It is a matter of convenience. It's a matter of making it easier for people to vote. We're going to bring out a report within the next month looking at selected counties in key places around the country. How does early voting work? A lot of different ways to do it because in the American system, every layer of jurisdiction has a election which they get to decide. Mm -hmm. Mostly, it's based on states and counties, as you mm -hmm. pointed out, in New York. So each county in some places has a slightly different mm -hmm. version of how to run early voting. It can start as early as 45 days to a month out. And by early voting, I mean in person before Election oh, Day person. voting. Not absentee yeah. ballots, um, but actual being able to come and cast a vote in person. Um, in some places, it's a week or two weeks before the election. So what went. happened to so the plan? The bill was passed by the Assembly, and now it's sitting in the Senate. And what we hear over and over and over again is that the county boards of elections are frightened of it. They feel that it is an unfunded mandate from the state. It'll be too confusing and hard for them to run the elections they feel, and perhaps rightly so, that they would need some budget allocation to run and polling no, places longer. And nobody longer. wants to pay money And for nobody wants to pay to run the elections, which we have, which are incredibly underfunded. Um, and so the idea of expanding uh, the number of hours that you might have a functioning polling place, mm. the number of days, gets resistance. And yet when we call election administrators in other states, North Carolina, Ohio, Florida, New Mexico, Maryland's instituting it now, and we say, how does this work for you? I talked to a small suburban county. I talked to, and they are also um, party driven in mm -hmm. their election administration. I talked to the Republican administrator and the uh, Republicans uh, who were uh, working on elections there, and they were effusive. They said, you couldn't make us stop doing this. Oh. Our voters love it. It's a great convenience. It alleviates the our long lines of the waiting everything well you can have long lines on election on early voting yeah, if yeah. a lot of people right. show up on the Saturday or Sunday yeah. before they said but the difference is number one we like it because it allows us to spread our work out over a long longer period less pressure on election day so they said we actually save some money on election day but they said most amazingly Let's say you get to the early voting place and everybody's decided that Sunday afternoon before the election is the time to get their vote out of the way. And there's an hour long line. They told us in this small county, uh, the Republican administrator said, people aren't cranky because they chose that day to when come. to come. And so they figure if it takes another half hour, yeah. that's okay. I left time for this. I got to decide. It just really works for people. Can I just ask you one question? The, we've, we've striven, as I'm a Democrat, I know you're nonpartisan, the Democrats have always wanted control of the Democrats of the, of the state Senate. They get control of the state Senate by electing more Democrats to the state Senate, and suddenly they don't have control anymore. What is this all about? Do you ever get into that kind of politics? Well, you know, <laughs> in, in the sense of who's going to be the leadership, again, we're nonpartisan. Yeah. What we want to know is this a well-functioning legislature, irrespective of who is in charge. Okay. And the proof to us, what is a well-functioning legislature? It's a legislature that can pick up and actually address Ooh, the people's business transparently and effectively. So it falls, though, into your premise that the people in power don't want to change, because if you have a stalemated legislature between the Assembly and the State Senate, we're much safer. 
Well, it's safer for them. <laughs> yeah, there absolutely. aren't too for them many is what changes, I meant. Yeah. right? And that's yeah. the really unfortunate thing is that yeah. sometimes we see what seems to be a shell game yeah. in Albany. It's very that's easy. That's what I meant when, if, if Albany was in New York and more attention was paid, would they be able to do the same shenanigans that they do? Well, I don't know. I don't know. Anyway. I Let's go to New York City elections yeah. because there's a lot of discussion now about the use of these machines. The lever and machines. And going back to the old lever machines. Horrible idea, Ronnie. Now, what is that all about? Well, that is, again, about the legislature mixing in the city's business where it should not be. This is a crisis that is absolutely to be laid at the feet of the legislature. The legislature has changed the primary date from June to September because they don't want to campaign in June. So it's more convenient for them to have the primary in September. Is that because they usually end the session in June end and they want June. to have the free time? That's correct. They want to be able, they don't want to but have how to. How long has it been since we've had a June primary? It's quite a while. It's quite a while. It's right. quite a while. But we've run into problems with the federal government because the September primary is set relatively late and there isn't enough time to prepare absentee ballots and mail them to our servicemen and women and Americans living overseas. So the state was sued by the federal government because it was disenfranchising New York service people. This was the time between the primary and the general election. That's correct. And the, so the court forced, actually reset the primary for the congressional race last year. You're, viewers may remember. So we ended up with three primaries because the legislature refuses to move from the September date. So now we come to 2013. So we spent a lot of money, which we could have spent for the Board of Elections. Right. Okay. Absolutely. <laughs> so now we come to 2013. We have this incredibly important mayor's race and the legislature gets to set the city primary, which I think is absolutely wrong. The city should set its primary, but the legislature gets to set it and they say, well, primaries are in September. And the runoff will be in two weeks if there needs to be a runoff, which everybody feels is very likely. The board looks at the situation and says two weeks is not a very long time to count all of the votes, prepare the necessary ballot, and run a second election. We need more time. And they have to get the mailing out, don't they? Yeah. They have to. And, you know, we need more time. So they go back to Albany and say, change the primary date. And Albany's like, why, why would we listen to you? Um, and so we come to the situation where it's pretty clear that two weeks is a very tight time. The Board of Elections looks at the situation and says, we have four choices. There are three ways in which we can change our procedures using the paper ballots and the optical scanners. Or, gee, if only we could go back to the lever machines. We're faster on those, we think. That would make it better. They go up to Albany and say, we need help. Change the primary. No, no change the primary put the uh, runoff a week further back. Well, we might do that, but hey, you ha gave us options. We like lever machines. I'm not sure what the mania for the lever machines is about with the elected officials. I understand how the public feels. There's something very satisfying mm -hmm. about pulling the lever, this great thunk. What people fail to remember is that the lever machines broke down all the time. They are an antiquated, old technology, hard to maintain, Spare parts are no longer manufactured. And when that machine goes down, you, nobody can vote in the election district. So everything stops for four or five hours. People forget that. We r have been running a hotline with NYPIRG for over 20 years. So we remember how many calls we got mm -hmm. from people who were hysterical because the lever machine was broken. And, and they have to board. substitute a paper ballot. And then a, a, long a, pro time. a provisional ballot, and the provisional ballot may not get counted. It's easier to attack which may be why the political apparatus is more interested in the lever machines. Because what's really important about the lever machines, in addition to the fact they break down left and right, there's no recount. Right. Whatever that counter on the back says. That's it. And there's no record. There's of no record. There's no way to go back and be sure it's accurate. And experts tell us that the, the lever machines lose between 5 and 17 percent of the vote. Not something that people spend a lot of time talking about before there were better alternatives. Mm. So the paper ballot has one real advantage, too, really. Even if the scanner isn't working, there's your ballot. Mm -hmm. You fill it out. It can be scanned later. It's preferable to scan it at your precinct, at your election district, and know for sure that you filled it out correctly. 
but you can fill it out. If you've got to vote and go, you can fill out the paper ballot. You can leave it. It will be counted later. But most importantly, if it's a close election, if there's any question, there's a recount. There's a recount. And it's not a recount of somebody's interpretation. Right. It's, it's your ballot. It's, in most cases, incontrovertible. You fill it out correctly, then people know what you intended. And it allows us to be sure that the people who are actually in office right. are the people we it's elected. looking at the individual ballot. When you recount on a machine, all you're doing is seeing if the numbers were transcribed correctly. That's correct, because it's a counter like an right. odometer. Uh, and experts say that, you know, we're told, oh, it's very hard to jigger that. Mm, no, actually, right. it's pretty easy to mess with the counter. Absolutely. And a, the counter is another place where it breaks down. When we run elections on the lever machines, a surprisingly high number of election districts come out at vote totals with 99. That's my Why yeah. would that be? Because it takes more mechanical effort mm -hmm. to get the counter to move from 99 to 100. And as the machines wear out oh, over they, time, oh, they don't register. They don't it. register the vote, so it doesn't click so you're over. You're losing all those votes. You're losing all. So those where do votes. we stand now? Well, now we stand um, in a model. There are, there's a bill that has passed the assembly, which if a gun were to my head and I had to pick a bill and be forced to use the lever machines, well, the assembly did a better job of trying to deal with a wretched and bad situation. And then there's a bill which has passed the state senate. So they've got to reconcile the two. If they reconcile the two, the board will have the ability to use lever machines, <laughs> but the runoff will be pushed back one week so there'll be three weeks and the runoff can. and it, and the runoff will not come on uh, a Jewish holiday so and the runoff will be a scan or will it be back on the lever machine back on the lever machines so in other words they're just abandoning the scanning for this election no no it's worse than that oh. it's worse than that you will <laughs> vote on the lever machine for the primary and the runoff but you'll vote on a paper ballot with a scanner oh, for, the, for general. the general. So everybody will be completely confused to the maximum extent possible. It's really outrageous. It's completely ridiculous. So how do we change this? Well, first of all... Is it the courts that somebody has to go to? Well, no, because the courts won't get into this. We have got to make it clear to our election officials that running embarrassing, poorly run elections is not acceptable that the system's got to change. Um, we're going to need an a overhaul top to bottom for our election system. We need to get the parties out of running elections, and we need to be sure that all aspects of our law are up to a 21st century standard. It's so going to take they have some time. This, they have this enormous responsibility, the Board of Elections of the City of New York. And then you could, is the mayor just disdainful of them? Yes, at this point it That's seems like... That's the word for a minute, yes. isn't it? Because he just thinks it's the party patronage and be gone with all of you. Right, But he's exactly. not willing to do anything about it. Well, he likes to talk about it a lot. But he, he hasn't done anything. Well, you know, it's a question of what he could actually do. He doesn't have really... You know, there are different schools of thought about that. In terms of having direct responsibility, little that he can mm -hmm. do. Um, but, but posing the issue. Yeah, posing the issue... And he's in a perfect situation because he's so, he ran as a Republican, but everybody knows he was a Democrat. I mean, he's so manipulated the party system to begin with. He has great stature. Yeah. And if he actually cared what the people thought yeah. and wanted to engage in some yeah. public education, he actually would be in a good position to do so and also to work within the executive, within the administration, and to work with the city council. Yeah. The one place that we, the, where there should be some control over the Board of Elections is in the budget. And there are counties where the county legislature really rides herd mm -hmm. on the Board of Elections, holds them to account, and basically you know, uses the budget process to be sure mm -hmm. that elections are being right. run uh, in the way that at least the legislature wants. I can honestly say in the 12 years that I was in the city council, the only discussions about with, with the Board of Elections was about the machines of switching from, you know, and that was so muddled that nobody understood what it was. But it doesn't come under government ops. Yes, it does. Oversight, and it does. I it mean, does. it should. It does. But and I don't remember are... big oversight hearings. Well, are but there? there are now. Now, yes, there so have much been more. regular oversight hearings. Good. But the 
But the board plays a wonderful shell game with the council where they will come and they'll be asked to provide uh, budget information. Um, and sometimes they provide it and sometimes they say they don't have it. And the status of the board's budget is always very, very murky. Again, I don't believe that's accidental. Mm. Um, but I do see that the city council has things that it can do. It mm. can hold the Board of Elections to account. But then again, why would they perhaps not want to take on the Board of Elections? <laughs> because they're elected by the old system. <laughs> so, you know, we've almost come to the end of the program. We haven't even talked about campaign finance reform, which was one of your major issues. Absolutely. So if people go to your website, commoncause.org, is it commoncausenny.org? It's commoncause.org forward slash NY. They will see a very comprehensive report on campaign finance which traces the contributions to the members, to the votes, to the whole system. And you'll see more of this circular kind of exactly. Uh, information. Exactly. But again, we don't have to put up with it. There are better alternatives. I'd love to come back some you other have to. time. And we will talk about campaign finance. It is near and dear to my heart. We will I definitely schedule another time. So thank you so much. And it was really great. And um, we'll follow you. And please go to this website and, and look at it very carefully. Thanks so much. Thank you. Is there any people you'd like to hear and topics you'd like us to explore? Please let me know. You can write to me at CUNY TV, 365 Fifth Avenue, New York, New York, 10016. Or you can go to the website at cuny.tv and click on Contact Us. I look forward to hearing from you.